Let's start by talking about the way the term psychopath has been stigmatized with the idea of the violent psychopath being the most prevalent one and what effects that has had on the way people think about psychopaths. Well, the way I'm using the term is a deliberate play on what you said. I am saying that what the common people, the essence of our planet would say is that individuality in its essence is a pathology. Mm -hmm. And if you begin to think about it, for an example, there was a book written about Kundalini and uh, the subtitle was Transcendence or Insanity. I don't know if you're familiar with that book. Uh, it sounds familiar. I haven't read it though. Yeah. Yeah, I read it years ago. Mm -hmm. The point is very simple. True individuality is regarded, particularly in Western culture, as a mental illness. Now, for the hell of it, I just differentiated between the sociopath and the psychopath. The psychopath is an older term and relates more to the idea of a person, where socio, of course, relates to the group. Mm -hmm. So for the group mind, psychopath and sociopath are really the same thing. There are people who are over and against the paradigm of reproduction, consumption, two chickens in every garage, and a car in every pot, mm -hmm. which is particularly the American ideal. Europe is a bit more open to true individuality than the United States is. This is a very conformist society. True. And that goes from the best universities uh, down to the slums. Mm -hmm. The only people who do not understand the truth of this, uh, the truth of the essence of commonness, you might say, are the lower middle class all the way up through what we normally consider the upper class. The real lower class people, the people in the street, understand. Mm -hmm. And also the super wealthy, the super powerful, which are beyond our normal comprehension of what powerful means, they understand. But the rest of mass man doesn't understand at all. Mm -hmm. if, if I remember correctly, there's only 600 known billionaires in the world. Now think about that. 600 known billionaires. Those people, they know. Most of my readers, and I would say most everyone, does not know, for an example, in many areas of the planet, groups of these people get together, the fathers with their sons, and they have private meetings for a week or two where they indoctrinate their sons into the secrets of the world. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not the Illuminati, as people so glibly throw about such phrases. These people really do things. They make things happen. And the people at the low end make things happen also. The ones in the middle, the big middle, these are, in essence, your true common folk. The ones who live with cliches, the ones who live in slogans, the ones who live in fantasies, the ones who have ideals while the whole world is falling down around them. They're holding up these ideals and fantasies of how things really are. These are the common people. Mm -hmm. So when you say that at the very highest level, these people are aware of what's going on, they know what's going on, it sounds like they're not just aware of it, but consciously furthering that goal, right? Yes, they know how to take advantage of any situation, whether it's peace or whether it's so-called chaos. Mm -hmm. Their goal is to better themselves and their genetic strain. Okay, now as far as a kind of uh, chicken or egg situation, is it because they're aware of the, the situation that they became billionaires and succeeded so well, or is this a case of 
being so removed from kind of the great common folk, this wisdom came to them? Well, the knowledge came to them, I think, in a lot of cases through the fact that they were genetically different and they were great observers. Mm -hmm. In order to see clearly, you cannot see through labels. You cannot see through words. Mm -hmm. If you understand ideology, people believe in things. These beliefs color their perception of reality. It makes everything into a delusion, an illusion, uh, whatever you want to call it. But everything is colored. You go to university and you listen to all the nonsense that these people believe in and all their ideals and all their stuff. Well, it makes them basically losers. They're basically food. Food for the great machine. They're being ground up. They're being used. And it doesn't bother them because they're not really capable of much more. I've experimented with this over the years. I have known a few people in the higher, higher, higher end of things and known more people in the lower, lower end of things because I come from the streets of Chicago. Now, the people of the streets of Chicago, the hoodlums and the gangsters and people like that, have a greater understanding of the world and how it really operates than the people who have PhDs people who have degrees, people who, who do anything normally, okay? They have a much greater understanding. You take one of those people, and if you can get them to behave properly, which takes a hell of a lot of work, they can easily, in one or two generations, reach pretty close to the top. But you take, for an example, I call them the Mula family. You know, dad goes to school, gets a Ph.D., marries the beautiful girl, he becomes a professor, he becomes that, he has two or three children. The world is perfect, it's idealistic, it's wonderful. Usually his children will go one step beneath him, not one step over him. They can't break the next barrier. It's too far away from them. They've been deluded with too many ideals. You take somebody in the street with an above-average IQ, and you train them, you teach them how to behave, you teach them how to do a lot of things and how to move amongst different kinds of people. They may jump up 10 steps on the so-called socioeconomic ladder. It sounds like especially academics with their obsession with words and you know, being able to verbalize things, that's just a net that catches them. and makes it impossible for them to really break through that next level? Yeah, well, it's impossible. When they're around me, I'm around them. They'll be throwing all these words around, and I'll say, define any term in the sentence you just threw at me. Mm -hmm. Well, don't you know you understand what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. said, no, I don't understand what you're talking about. Tie it down to something. Duh. Then I'll start laughing or clapping my hands, and they get very upset and confused because everyone else around them has bought into the same paradigm. So they each know what they're talking about, but they don't know what they're talking about because they can't do anything with it. Tell them to go to the laboratory and demonstrate and to show, they don't even know what you're talking about half the time. Demonstrate it to me, show it to me. What? What are you talking about? And that's what you're talking about when you say they speak in cliches and slogans. Yeah, not a set of slogans like a mathematician or uh, symbols that a mathematician or a true scientist would speak in, because those are conveniences, as well as keeping things as clear as possible so we can accomplish something. Mm -hmm. But if you're at a business meeting and Bill says, well, I want to take over this corporation here, and the first thing you hear from five of the MBAs is, well, what's going to be the impact? Then you know you're in the wrong meeting. You should be in the meeting which says, okay, we know what the impacts are, how are we going to get around them, how are we going to negotiate our way out of this, or into it. Mm -hmm. That's how the real players play with each other. They speak, if you would, like a mathematician speaks, but it's still in code. But they understand their codes, and all their codes have things to do. Yeah. 
their codes are somehow more tied to the world. They're tied to yeah, their world and their goal of perpetuating their gene and their fortunes from one generation to the next. This is the most important thing for them. So what's the connection or correlation between this person you've described and the person we normally think of as creative or an, or an artist or that kind of thing? Do you think there's any correlation between the two? Well, I, th- I think they have a smell of it, a hint of it, but they're bogged down. They're bogged down by their past. Mm-hmm. They're not undone to any significant degree, as I would put it. How many great artists have we created or come from this country? How many great philosophers? How many great scientists? How many great anythings? This is the country of the common man. The common man lives by fictions. The artist think that the guy who's on the edge has to be very careful. The goal is to kill him. The only use a great man has to the masses is what they can do and how they can utilize his idea. They have no understanding of what his idea is. First, they want to kill him because he's a threat to their sleep. If he survives, and after he gets over that, maybe after he's dead for 20 years or 100 years, he now becomes one of them in their mind because they figured out a way, or someone has figured out a way for them, to utilize his art or to utilize his idea, so on and so forth. You see that in pretty much every area of human endeavor. About every 20 years, somebody digs up somebody. But, but yeah, the last theory in it becomes fashionable again. Well, let's see, how long has Tim Leary been dead? Ten years? I don't remember. Yeah, ten, I think. So I saw him two weeks before he died in L.A., Beverly Hills. Regardy said in the introduction to one of my books that he thought Leary would be recognized in the future. Mm-hmm. Well, Falcon has a number of his books, and I must say the sales of them have in fact decreased, but of course only hmm. been 10 years. Yeah, that's interesting. I I wondered what kind of legacy he's going to leave behind. Well, when he died, he uh, left a trust. To my knowledge, they're doing very little. Hmm. He's considered, I would say, by the establishment as a psychopath. Now, he was a unique individual. Most of that had to do with his high intelligence and his ability to manipulate people. And you think that's a a natural-born ability to some extent? Oh, yeah. You could learn aspects of it, but for him it was first nature. You might say it was natural for for Tim. Now, regard, he came from the lower classes, and he was, on the surface, quite congenial, nice gentleman sort of character, but he didn't have the sense of reality that Timmy had. Mm-hmm. But Rigardi was also one of those unique individuals, and he died in 85. It's 20 years, and his work has not really caught on, and basically no one cares that much about it. We, of course, have some of the books, so we can observe the sales of these things. And mostly the sales are to fringe people who, in essence, won't put in the necessary effort to accomplish anything. So they don't fall within my group of what I call the psychopath or the extreme individual. I talked to um, Are You Serious? His book, The Countercultures Through the Ages. I think what you're talking about is part of it, the strain of kind of ruthless individualism and really going beyond conventions. His book traces how it sort of springs up, you know, every however many years. And it's kind of always there, but in some cases it's more prevalent than in others. Mm -hmm. It kind of seemed to be the the flip side of what you talk about, the hysterical epidemics, where it seems like all of society has kind of gone mad for a little while. This seemed to be the more, more rational and yet unconventional strain running beside that. Do you feel like we're in a in an age where 
we're more towards the the hysterical epidemic side of it, or do you see more of these fringe elements, these extreme individuals cropping up right now? I see more in Europe. I see more in uh, other countries than I do in this country. Mm -hmm. This country, in my view, is becoming an afterbirth. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that's a cyclical thing, or do you think that's innate to America? Well, I think it's both. I think it's innate to this country at this point, and it's also cyclical. Europe had its ups and downs, Mm -hmm. but the amount of variance that is tolerated in in this country is much lower now than it was in the roaring 60s and the 70s. Variability, which is the sign of possibility, was much higher then than it is at this time in this country's history. Now, whether the arthritis that we're in now will lead to a rupture in the near future, which I hope it does, I don't know. I don't know. The slope of the curve going down now is accelerating, and until you really hit bottom, you're not going to have a a bleep up. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. You just look at the hysteria over saying the phrase Merry Christmas at the end. <laughs> I mean, this is ludicrous. Yeah. It's just words. Just sounds. Yep. So, taking the idea that you kind of need mutation to move forward, to have any kind of progress, I mean, what do you think would happen if, if somebody with Timothy Leary's kind of gift for observation and for manipulation and high intellect... I mean, if they were around today, where do you think you would find them? Obviously not in any kind of counterculture at this point, it seems. I I think they would be in small groups, working on various projects, keeping a low profile, Mm -hmm. publishing their material uh, in Europe. I mean, I know uh, scientists who are doing things, but getting their work published even uh, in American academic journals is next to impossible for them because it goes against the preconceptions as a scientist myself, as a behavioral scientist. And at one time in my life, having been a published peer-reviewed person and also a reviewer of journal articles submitted, it is much more likely that you're going to be published and survive with unusual concepts and unusual ideas in another culture than in your own at this time in this country. So I have an associate who has some very interesting ideas, and many of them have been proven in the laboratory. But he has had to go to England uh, to get his uh, research published. What kind of stuff was he working on? He was working on origins of life and electromagnetics and things along those lines. Hmm. We seem to not be too big on that right now. Mm-mm. We a re- all know how everything was created. Right. <laughs> South Korea is actually ahead of us on, on a lot of that research. That's true. And cloning and all that. It's kind of disturbing. Well, you, you look at the hysteria over stem cells. If you looked at it from an objective point of view, you'd have to regard these people to be insane. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm now putting out the course. In fact, the first overview with the DVD is now on Falcon's webpage. So that material is now being made available. And some people will start and use the material, and some people will benefit from it. And the people who benefit from it will probably become more successful. But in many ways, they will also drop out in a lot of ways, or they'll move to Cancun or Brazil, or they'll move to France. I forgot what his name was, uh, the guy who had sex with a 14-year-old. Polanski. Yeah, Yeah. Polanski. Yeah. I mean, I saw an interview that after, what, 30 years now? Yeah. They won't let him back in because the L.A. County District Attorney said, we'll arrest him and prosecute him. Yeah. You tell me what type of insanity are we looking at here? This country has taken the worst of the Old Testament and all of the New Testament, and that's how they're living. This is the way we live. This is reality. Now, death worship is, in essence, how I would describe things. And I agree with Freud, who in 1920 and beyond the pleasure principle came up with the idea 
that there are two opposing instincts. Now, if we take that point of view, there are two opposing instincts. How can we understand human behavior? Because everything is based on the assumption of what? Eros. Mm -hmm. that people do things for their best interest, which is utterly nonsense. They don't do things for the best interest, and why? If you look at the last hundred years of war, from my scanning of the different numbers, 20th century war dead, not wounded, but dead, I believe the numbers run anywhere from 2 billion billion to 4 billion. Now, how many is that a year if we take 3 billion? The 20th century, we killed, the, what, 30 million people a year if I got my zeros right? That sounds right, yeah. Yeah. I would believe that. And yet, turn on television, turn on Fox in particular, and you see all the morons smiling, never asking one question. Hmm, if all these bad things are happening, what is wrong? It's never the nature of the species that's the problem it's always something out there that's the problem yeah. not enough family values not enough education you can throw all the family values you want all the money at education you want hmm? what do you get yeah. I remember during part of the rebellion period of the 60s and 70s that professors had to give B's to minority students so here you have surgeons operating in an operating room who should have gotten an F, got their medical license because they had to be accounted for, and some silly idea of balance. You see, this is the problem. The species is the problem, and this is the point of all of my work. Until you look at the inherent flaws in the brain of this species, you're never really going to make an orgasmic leap on this planet mm -hmm. unless you have, as Dr. Regardi pointed out, major nuclear holocaust mm. and simply hope that what comes out of it is better than what is now. And we both used to pick up our uh, drinks and laugh at that point. <laughs> the point I was making earlier is that in the booklet that accompanies the DVD and CD, I explain the problem very clearly, that you're dealing with a flawed species. Flawed only because it has a, the wrong idea about itself. It's not flawed because it can't be compared to anything except to the conceptions and ideas it creates about itself, which are flawed. Wrong, 100% wrong. The relationship between the neocortex and the subcortex is so bad. Fibers running to the frontal lobes are significantly greater than fibers running back from the frontal lobes down to the limbic system and the lower brain centers. Now, what does that tell you? Hmm? Well, I think you put it in... Uh in undoing yourself, you say that biology supports culture and not the other way around. That's right. Yeah. I almost got thrown out of a PhD program. I had to take a, an advanced course in cultural anthropology, mm -hmm. doctorate seminar. And the professor, he wants everyone to come up with their own definition of what culture is. And I, it was my turn, and I said, culture is nothing more. And I used that phrase hmm. than the interaction of genes and geography thereby creating a feedback loop from one generation to the next. Everyone wants to think in pure ideas, in otherworldliness ideas, that this world is not as real as their ideas about this world. So Freud said, as a going back to him and beyond the pleasure principle, said at the end, I think near the end of the book, that in the future it will be biology which determines whether or not his assertion of a death instinct or thanatos, which relates to that, is true or not. And of course, what happened, I believe in the 70s or 80s, it was discovered at the molecular level that there were programmed, programmed death cells yeah. that were 
active, not just the cells would wear down from use. They were programmed. Now that's suggestive. But if you look at human behavior, you want to jump to the conclusion that it's more than suggestive. It, it's proof that the human organism is self-destructive and wants to destroy others. And then if you, if you think that way, you have to begin to think what happens when the instinct to destroy others and yourself is frustrated. So basically I've developed what I call in my unnatural meditation system called energized meditation. The only mantra in the system is nothing external. It's no phrase like OM or anything like that. Basically the mantra is the person himself break the person down through various exercises and release, if you would, new and more interesting sensations. And then re-put all these sensations back together again in the hope and the attempt to reprogram and deprogram part of the brain problem and part of the conditioning and imprinting problem that this particular species has. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting because you would never see any of the big three organized religions doing something that focused on the body rather than on words and ideas and verbalizations. Yeah. See, the idea of energized meditation is a rebellion against the species. Because if you become an individual, you are breaking the law of commonness. And there is no room for you. Mm-hmm. As I said earlier, the only time true rebellion and uncommonness is acceptable is if the commonness and their leaders can benefit from it. And that drive to maintain the status quo, I mean, that's why people talk about their ideas about the world rather than the world itself. The really smart ones will build 50,000 or 100,000 homes for the poor and put them in it and employ them in their factories and finance the homes through their own corporations. Mm -hmm. That's what the smart people do. And provide schooling for them. So in essence, what we're going to have is gigantic Sears and Robux mm -hmm. competing maybe a half a dozen of them from cradle to grave. And the people are desperate for this. They're desperate. The smart people, they're not going to fight against the masses, they have to keep them from revolting. And if perchance they do revolt, they're so well hedged, it doesn't make that much difference, but it's more costly. So let's build them 100,000 homes. Let's put them to work in our technocratic universe. Let them go to their little churches and pray, and we'll finance their houses. We don't care, we're off somewhere on our 300-foot yacht enjoying ourselves laughing, and they're the ones who are going to benefit from any research on immortality and any research on increased intelligence that's being done, because they can buy it. One way you put it in the book, you say, no matter how pathetic everyone is looking out for their best interests, for most people their best interest consists of not being punished. Few play to win, they play to be safe while feeling morally superior to the winner. I That's think, true. yeah, in that case, you have people feeling morally superior to what they consider the heartless CEO or, or whatever. Well, and the heartless Dr. Hyatt, that's how people perceive my work, which is fine. In that sense, I am heartless. The fact that I help people that I value and that I admire is irrelevant because I'm not helping the people they admire and they need. Yeah. I don't care about them. And that's one good way of defining a psychopath. I don't care about your peer group or the group that supports your sense of superiority or your sense of obtaining meaning or value. Another quote you have from the book, you say, uh, few people have the strength and fortitude to stare directly into the eyes of the future forms which are preparing to take our place. That again seems to tie into what you're talking about. I think people kind of pay lip service to the ideas of universal compassion and so on. Meanwhile, while they're doing all that talking, they're slowly being replaced by people who don't believe in that. Gurdjieff said, food for the moon. Mm -hmm. 
and that's what they are. Why are we any different than any other organism on this planet? We're food. Mm -hmm. Somebody is eating us right now. Someone is digesting. And someone will shit us out. And we'll be replaced. And we'll be replaced. <laughs> you mentioned earlier your battle with the PhD board. One thing I read about when you were up for mandatory licensing seminar in 1987, mm -hmm. and they said that you're required to report child molestation in instances where the person consulting is a member of the Golden Dawn, Temple of Set, Church of Satan, and all that. That intrigued me because at the same time you had just started a charter of the Golden Dawn, right? Somewhere sure. around that time? Uh -huh. What was that conflict like? There was a checklist. Mm-hmm. I no longer hold any license. I have two, one as a clinical psychologist and one as a marriage and family therapist. I've let both expire and I'm no longer licensed and haven't been for many years. On the checklist, they even mentioned Aleister Crowley's name. That was a sign that there was a potential child abuse problem. And I brought that to the attention of my attorneys, and they thought it was hysterical. And there was an article, I believe, in a magazine for professionals called California Therapist, where there was a licensed therapist who was using Santeria methods on his patients who believed in that system. Mm-hmm. And they were looking into that as being uh, unethical and dangerous. Hmm. If the board knew that I had co-authored Pacts with the Devil and Urban Voodoo, and they knew the things I stood for and the things I wrote, they would have had me up on charges. It's a system for enforcing their own beliefs, then. Uh-huh. Some of the people that started the board were outright fundamentalists. Hmm. I remember speaking to one of them because he had put in the law that only people with nonprofit institutions could have interns. Well, I wasn't. And I regarded the law as unconstitutional. And he personally called me and we had uh, spies come in from the board and would come in as patients and Four patients, that's who my interns saw, and uh, one of them was basically arrested, and uh, I was brought up in front of them, and they came in uh, with badges and guns and the whole damn thing, because they were part of consumer affairs, and they have the right to arrest, and we actually were responsible for forcing them to change the law. Hmm. But he was as Christian as uh, born again type as the day is long. And they want to see psychotherapy, psychology, etc., from the point of view of Christianity, which is not what it was supposed to be. That always intrigues me. Robert Anton Wilson wrote about Reich's back and forth with the American Medical Association and Niels Bohr having such a problem with quantum mechanics. And you'd kind of think these so-called scientific communities would not have that kind of ideological entrenchment going on. Ideally, you think that they're beyond that, but it's surprising how often they really aren't at all. Oh, no, they're not, because you, you use the nice phrase, ideological entrenchment. <laughs> I simply call it fear sure, yeah. and power which if they dealt with it in that way, then I would respect them. But they don't deal with it in that way. They want to appeal to a higher power, and that's what ideology is all about. Appealing, if you would, to an otherworldliness. If you look at a child, it's the same thing with a child. The child sees its parent as omnipotent. This whole process continues throughout adult life. So while you and I know what's going on, there's part of us that still go along with the authority because that's what we did. So we have to fight against our conditioning at all times. I went to school with a couple of fairly intelligent people, and one of them ended up going to Harvard, kind of did that whole thing. And it, it sort of surprised me that 
they seemed so intelligent and yet for however intelligent they were they still couldn't quite see outside of the little sphere of what's socially acceptable that had you been know why? what they've I'll been placed in based on research solid mri research the area in the lower brain i'll stay away from large words okay that is closest to the emotional centers is also the same area of the brain that houses the names of people. As we move further away from the emotional centers, we next have the area that houses the names of animals. And as we move further away, we next have the area that houses the name for tools and implements. Now, what is the implication of that? No matter how intelligent we are, our basic nature is a group beast, right? Yeah. Because that's our support mechanism. Our primary support mechanism are other people. Yeah. And that's hardwired. You draw on a fairly large variety of traditions in both the Psychopath's Bible and Undoing Yourself. Do you think all of those traditions point toward the extreme individual? Even those groups had kind of their support groups. Mm -hmm. It's not the end goal. It's one step towards post-humanity or whatever. Do you think the, the extreme individual is the only end point for those traditions? Well, I don't know if I really understand what you're asking. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm trying to get at the support group. Everybody innately, because of biology, looks to mm -hmm. other people as a support group. In your book, you spend a lot of time breaking down that kind of innate connection to other people. Mm -hmm. So, in breaking down all those connections, do you kind of necessitate completely severing those ties in, in order to move? Yeah, you have to sever the automated ties. I see what you're trying to get at. If I'm by myself for a week or two, I start getting weird. Mm -hmm. I need contact from other monkeys. Instead of going into highfalutin relationships and commitments and all this nonsense, which I regard as bullshit, I go hang out at a place where people know me and they're nice and I get my social fix. Mm -hmm. When I'm done, I pay my bill and go back. But that's my choice. I need the social fix. There's no question about it. Yeah. It's a drug. It's an addiction. I'm using metaphor, obviously. It's hardwired in. So I need to be around people. I have two little dogs, and they provide me with satisfaction to provide that part of me with satisfaction. But it's not sufficient. Mm -hmm. So I need other people. But I choose who and where I go. If I go shopping for food, I try to go shopping when there are least people at the supermarket. I don't like being with them, yet I need them, because I'm a human animal also. But I'm not a complete victim of it, like most people are. For an example, I won't go to a place where everybody is touching and pushing and, you know, I can't understand having a vacation with 10 million people surrounding me, yeah. who I haven't chosen. I do get lonely after a couple of weeks working and researching and being isolated, and then I go out and get my social fix. But it's an addiction. Now, if people heard me talking like that, they'd think I was crazy. And maybe I am, because I have spent a good part of my life recognizing these things and trying to undo myself from being a victim of all these automated behaviors. But I tend to prefer my own company and the company of a few people and I travel I'll be going to South America in January to meet with certain people and I meet with them three or four times a year they'll come here sometimes and I'll go there and then I'm going to Europe in March to meet with other people but those are people I'm choosing to meet now I do have to fly in the airplane and do have to be in the airport. And the way I deal with that is I consciously hypnotize myself 
put a smile on my face and nod my head. I don't want to engage people in their nonsense because they have more guns than I do. <laughs> it all comes back to that, doesn't it? Yes, it does. He's got the most guns. Because they put you there. If you reject your tribe, what happens? Ostracization. If you go back to my model on the brain, being kicked out of your tribe, what does it mean? Death, right? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. You got kicked out of your cave, and it meant death. So we have made an advancement as long as we don't stimulate them too much. And as long as I remain unpopular, then everything is fine. <laughs> I think Marilyn Manson recommends Psychopath's Bible. That's true. He, he yeah. is uh, one of the, the few that way. Yeah, I mean, I guess that would be the next question is if you get any kind of critical mass of people who are practicing this kind of increased awareness, I guess you would call it, what happens then? Well, I'm 62, so, you know, what's going to happen? They'll put me, put me away for the last 10 or 15 years? <laughs> Shoot me is an easy way out for me. But they have all forms of torture. And we're working on getting those uh, legalized, I guess. <clears throat> well, let's hope so. We wouldn't want people to feel bad about breaking the law, would we? Right. You know, if something is offensive to you, just make it legal and everyone will do it. Yeah. And I think some people are even trying to not make it a felony for a 19-year-old to have sex with a 16-year-old, because that's horrifying. Just think of the consequences. <laughs> just think of what might happen. Yeah. I remember I had to deal with that, with a legal situation with a person who was 19 and they were having a sexual relationship with a 17-year-old. That was, I don't know, 30 years ago. And I'll bet getting the law involved really didn't help in that situation, did it? I almost quote the lawyer. He said, there's no publicity value in that. However, if it were you, that is me, having a relationship with a 17-year-old, it would be prosecuted because there's publicity value in it and election value in it. Hmm. So we can take all their wonderful ideals and all their wonderful fantasies and burn them. And that's what we have to do with ourselves. We have to burn them out of ourselves and learn how to get along with the monkeys and do our work and have our enjoyments and most enjoyments people have are not really enjoyment. They're all suffered. And you watch people on vacation, and they're suffering. They have to see this, and they have to see that, and they have to go there, and they have to do this. That's not a vacation. And what is the word vacation? In Europe, they call it a holiday, right? In America, they call it to vacate. Right. And yet they carry the vacate with them. No matter where you go, there you are. You've been on vacations to Hawaii or places like that? Yeah, I've been on cruise ships before. Yeah. <laughs> People trying very hard to have fun. Mm -hmm. Very hard. So the idea of the hedonist is another nonsense delusion. Most of these people don't know the difference between avoiding pain and having pleasure. They're mm -hmm. two different things. Two different neural circuits to a large extent. So as Freud was right again in the sense that biology is destiny. <laughs> Women don't like hearing that. <laughs> in a certain sense, obviously confusing those two circuits plays into the hands of people who kind of keep the system running. If you start having people who know what real pleasure is, then you have a, a problem, I think. Well, yes. Yeah. What's all this nonsense about sexual regulation? It's utter nonsense. It increases the probability of crime happening by their definition of the word crime. It also increases the probability of more children, which is what they want, because then there's more to exploit, more units, and they give the units the illusion that the units themselves are making free choices. But if you look at it, it's sort of hysterical in a way. Here is everyone basically doing the same thing, each one of them thinking what they're doing is their choice, and each one thinking their choices are unique. Yeah. So everybody is doing what they have to do and seeing that it is a free will issue. I've decided to get married and have children. Duh. Doesn't hmm. anyone get it? 
it is pretty fascinating to watch that uh, rationalization process at work. People who work in banks or whatever cubicle they're in, mm-hmm. how often they can kind of tell themselves that they have only this option or they're doing this because they want to and it's what they have to do. Well, you guys have stepped out of step a bit, haven't you? What are you doing? Well, we do a magazine, so <laughs> we have kind of our own slightly divergent path, I guess. Mm-hmm. You know, I've been doing the, the same thing. Even though Tim, for an example, published with the mass market, none of his books really made that much money. What he got is a lot of college kids who bought his books, but what are they doing now, working for the bank? Yeah. <laughs> so I've been doing my work writing this kind of stuff for 25 years. And I have a small following of people. Mm -hmm. That's it. Some of them are extremely interesting. Some of them are very powerful people. But basically I make no great impact on the masses. If I did, I'd have to rework all of my thoughts. I knew something would be wrong. Now, you remember what happened to Rajneesh, Osho? Well, how did he get into all this trouble? He bought a gigantic piece of property and he began competing with the people in power. He started his own government and his whole thing. And what happened to him? Many of his followers think he was murdered. And I guess that's not that surprising. No, it's not. No, it's not at all. Tolerance for variability is very low. The Psychopath's Bible is incredibly dangerous, and what you'll read within here may destroy you and that kind of thing. But I think looking at it, it seems like it draws from an ideology or a a tradition that appeals to a minority, but one that has kind of... common. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's fairly... Benign. Yeah, yeah, and there are a number of different thinkers that have espoused a lot of what you're talking about in different Mm -hmm. words. My reaction to this kind of stuff is that it's, I don't see it as extreme anymore. And I wondered if if it still, to you, seems as far out as it might have 25 years ago or even further back when you first started looking into it. Well, it's not extreme for the extreme, not at all. As I mentioned, the college professors, it's extreme for them. And it's extreme for the average person. It's extreme even for a lot of fringe people. But from my perspective, no, it's not extreme. It was my way of making a statement and through its development, providing an outline of of a course for people who in fact want to do something rather than simply talk. And I thought it would be a wonderful way of uh, disguise and infuriation and uh, so on and so forth. Now, one of my friends who's now dead said that a lot of things I write would reach more people if I would be nicer. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if those are the people I want to reach. Right. I mean, I've seen Jerry Falwell hold up a number of my books on television, but nothing has come out of it. To him, it's not only extreme, it's beyond extreme. It's incomprehensible, I think. It's incomprehensible. (laughs) Yeah. Except that he's an excellent example of someone who learned. He believes all of his stuff, every bit of it, all the nonsense. Yeah. Is that a half-ass answer to your question? Yeah, I think that that gets close to what I was looking for. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for your time. Okay, you have a pleasant day, and thank you for the call.